online training. Uh, before I move forward, I request uh, our uh, honored uh, director, Dr. P. K. Uh, Pramod Kumar Pandey, to give an inaugural address for this uh, program. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Good morning to everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome each one of you to this very important program of uh, recirculating aquaculture system. Uh, that is uh, one of the very important area. Today, everybody is talking about RAS. So, I would like to welcome each one of you to this very important program. And each one of you are really very, very important, those who have joined. And I'm quite sure that during these three days, this is one day program, isn't it? Yeah, yes. Uh, this uh, During this one day program, we'll be learning. And this is only to initiate those who are interested. Those who are uh, learning first time, those who are hearing first time about RAS, they will come to know about the basics, that what are the fundamentals and how to approach. So the basic idea is how, why do we need the recirculatory aquaculture system? If you see the population is growing day by day, land is shrinking, Food requirement is increasing. Not only that, if you see in a country like India, already we are in position to meet the food security. But now it is high time wherein we should think in terms of the nutritional security. Because if you do not talk, if you do not address the issues related to nutritional securities, what will happen? <coughs> We may start producing the progeny who are retarded in their mind. We may start producing the progeny who are dwarf. Ultimately, all these are going to lead to the problem. Not only that, even if you see the recommended level of the fish consumption by United Nations, that is through FAO, is 20 kg per person. While the fish consumption in the country like India is somewhere around 9 kg per person. And at the same time, the number of people who are eating the fish are increasing day by day. So therefore, there is urgent need and requirement to increase the fish production. And especially to those areas which are not having a vast land. So there also, the, it is very much important and very much required to intensify the seed productions. And for that purpose, this RAS is very, very important. Apart from that, we also need to look into the water requirement because water is becoming a scarce resource over the period of the time. And if you do not conserve, if you do not use these waters properly, uh, really we are going to have a tough time in the coming days. So RAS is one of the solutions to conserve the water, to recycle the water, to reuse the waters, so that wastage can be minimized. And since uh, I'm not going to give, uh, deliver the lecture in detail, I'm making only the opening remarks. So I would like to test few of the points. And one of the very important points you see that easily we can produce 15 to 20 kg of the fish per cubic meter. Or uh, if we try to extrapolate it in terms of the hectare, that turns out to be even if you keep 15 kg, which is uh, very easy to produce. Am I right, Rajesh? Rajesh? Yes, sir. How much uh, maximum we can produce through RAS per, per cubic meter? Yeah, maximum one can produce 120 kg per meter. 120 <laughs> maximum. Yeah, so even if you keep say 15 kg, I'm telling. And then if you extrapolate in terms of hectares, it turns out to be 150 tons. And 150 tons of trout, if you say, because since we are dealing with the cold water fisheries and RAS is very, very popular with respect to the culture of the trout fish. So 150 tons, if you try to multiply by 400 rupees per kg. That is the minimum price. 
otherwise invariably it is selling at the rate of 600 rupees kg and at times it goes 1000 and more than 1000 rupees kg also but even if you keep rupees 400 per kg it turns out to be rupees 6 crore worth up in in overall uh, terms and out of that even if you keep 50 percent of the input cost so the profit of three crores per hectare of course it is a very generalized picture i'm just trying to give so let us not uh, take it uh, uh, exactly as i'm telling six crore three crores but that i'm just trying to highlight the kind of opportunity the kind of potentiality the sector is having and then considering that sinking of the land reuse of the water increasing demand of the food especially those food which are rich in the nutrients especially in the protein omega-3 fatty acids RAS is going to play a very vital role very important role in coming days so those farmers who are entering into this RAS business at the early age they'll be really benefited and they can mint money like anything I believe firmly that uh, after information technology if there is any other sector which is booming as on today, which is a rising sector, which is a sun sector, that is fisheries and aquaculture. And especially when we are using this RAS, that's a really great opportunity. Of course, initially some amount of investment, capital investment is required. But for that purpose, also Government of India has made provision through Prime Minister Mat Sampada Yojana, wherein they are giving the subsidy up to 40%, 50% and so on through National Fishery Development Board, which is located in Hyderabad. So there is great opportunity to make use of this, make money. And this is very, very important for making money. That is health and wealth. Both will be taken care through fisheries and aquaculture. And especially the role of recirculatory aquaculture is very, very important if you are trying to address these issues. With, with, with these few words, once again, I welcome each one of you and uh, I hope and believe that this one day session will be really useful and this will connect you. That is the most important thing because see, in one day, it is just not possible to disseminate all the information which is required. But then this will put you in the right path wherein you can have your own research wherein you get the connected you get connected to the people who are really expert in the ras especially rajesh biju and some of our scientists who are really working and will be really happy to help you wherever we can whatever help you expect especially in terms of technical support please do not expect any financial support from us we do not have any kind of the provision when it comes to the financial but definitely we will be in position to guide you to help you how to get the finance also with these few words once again i welcome each one of you and i wish all the best for this one day program thank you very much uh, thank you sir for your um, apt uh, inaugural uh, speech which will actually imp impact uh, it will reduce my job also in the in way so without wasting further time we'll start the session the first session will be yeah, present this slide. Uh, before I go further, I kindly request not to switch on the mic. If somebody wants to have any doubts or question, uh, they can put it in chat box and we will take up in the end, at the end of the uh, both the session. Hope my slides are visible now. Ritesh, sir, is it visible? Okay. So, once again, uh, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar series. Uh, basically, this is the second webinar on recirculating aquaculture system for intensive farming of rainbow trout. We had this, uh, this uh, webinar on January. Uh, once again, there was a lot of participants, more than 500 participants participated. Uh, what it uh, what was interesting is that after the webinar there was a lot of queries and uh, information people are asking about the information and more uh, about that 
that connected uh, with a lot of people and even uh, let us what people require actually what they want to know uh, that also we came to know in the previous webinar in this webinar uh, series like uh, we will cover as the basic aspect of uh, ras as well as some of the, the updates what we have because we are also working on a few models of ras which uh, based on the updates also we will be giving so as sir said the uh, clearly that uh, ras uh, is gaining importance mainly because uh, there is uh, land and water they are declining day by day the competition from other food producing sectors so before i would uh, to emphasize the importance of this ras i would uh, first mention what exactly happens how re rainbow trout farming happens actually at the current situation uh, this may be even applicable to other fish um, other uh, farming of fishes like in, maybe in pond system or in even in intensive coastal farming so in case of rainbow trout farming mostly it is cultured currently in flow through systems where huge flow of water is required and the water flow if you calculate for how for kg of fish it, it's somewhere around 50000 to 1 lakh liter of water for every kg of fish produced now why we require to flowing water it is mainly to supply do and to remove the metabolites which accumulate over the period of time ammonia carbon dioxide or fecal matter now the other thing is that the culture du culture duration is almost 12 to 15 months this is mainly due to the seasonal changes in water uh, quality because there is a, a severe winter in uh, upper land and this will reduce the growth rate and the same reason will also affect the production efficiency and especially the feed efficiency recently many of the farmers uh, especially in himachal pradesh and some are in uttarakhand also will agree these kind of farming which is uh, affected by weather calamities due to flooding and a heavy rain there's a lot of siltation can occur and the farmers can lose complete stock this is one uncertainty with because we are totally depending on the nature and especially when the raceways are dependent on the snow fed the rivers this is a uh, uh, major problem and one of the the recent fao report says that the aquaculture production uh, which is currently at 4.5% the global uh, growth rate is around 4.5 percentage which is expected to decrease to less than 2.5 percent in another 10 20 years one of the major reason which was cited is uh, the more strict uh, strict law enforcement for uh, especially the effluent discharge this is can be in a definitely an issue with intensification causing the problem to uh, problem to the nature uh, natural systems so we need more sustainable farming and uh, more sensible farming so that we preserve our environment to the future generation also of course we need more land and what uh, water for this system uh, to be operated now to overcome this we started working on ras and we were able to find out some of the key points from this uh, this as an environmental uh, point one is we are able to reduce to the water requirement to around 1000 liter per kg from that is 50 fold reduction and the the, uh, the reduction in culture duration also we could achieve instead of 12 months we were able to get in 6 to 7 months the culture one crop and the feed efficiency also was ranging from 0.9 to 1 to in our systems uh, what we observed in last two, uh, two uh, crops and the land requirement also we, when we consider it was two times lesser than the the raceways which is required uh, if you consider for in a pond aquaculture system it, it can be much less it can be much less because so maximum productivity of pond uh, with the 40 tons of fish also the same amount of fish can be produced less than 0.1 hectare whereas uh, in the pond system which might require one hectare that's what uh, the director sir was emphasis emphasizing so we were able to produce uh, in a small pilot scale system uh, 1200 kg of uh, fish within seven months uh, where earlier thought people in fact people discouraged us no it is not possible to culture rainbow trout in dean because the climate scenario is not climate condition is but then 
Today, we are able to produce the beam tile in climate. We are able to produce beam, uh, rainbow trout mainly because possible due to this technology. And there are many advantages which we further need to cash upon. One is, uh, yeah, the waste management. There is a possibility for, because the, uh, the, the waste generated in RAS is very, very uh, concentrated. So we can use it for further valorization and uh, even nothing is waste because the amount of wastage which comes is very less which can be even the water uh, which can be utilized in other agriculture product uh, produce another important factor is aquatic invasion because of entry of exotic fishes there are many problems in natural system we lost many uh, the native species but then that can be controlled very much even if you are introducing some fast growing or other exotic fishes that's the advantage of this system. So with the, how did we achieve this? So this, uh, this presentation, I will take you around how, how we did achieve and how did, what did we plan? So basically before going to what is an RAS basically, or what is the RA, a simply recirculatory ecosystem, which I now onwards I'll call simply RAS. Now this is simply, we are enhancing the productivity of a system. Just to give you an example, a pond system, uh, which is by itself, uh, which can only support around 0.4 to 1 kg per cubic meter of water. Uh, that much fish as a, or a biomass only it can support because the oxygen will be limiting factor. So if we provide oxygen in through a pedal aerator or whatever, we can increase the productivity uh, to 40 tons per hectare. That is uh, uh, almost around four kg per cubic meter. But then the next level, the limitation will be the metabolites, the ammonia excretion, the solids, which need, we need to flush. So for that, we need to exchange the water regularly. Here, exactly what we do is enhance the different, um, it may be oxygen supply, or it may be removal of uh, a metabolite, or it may be removal of solids. So all these mechanisms we provide in this system so that the whole overall productivity is increased. So we can simply define it as a technology uh, where uh, various levels of mechanical and biological filters and used for uh, improving the productivity of the system. So there are wide array of arrays you can see in a different people, different uh, people follow different uh, system for uh, maybe mechanical biology, different kind of, which I will be explaining some of them. So, but then the principle almost remains the same, the same uh, objective, you, you have to remove the waste and to, uh, need to add the oxygen required. So technically you can culture any kind of fishes in RAS, maybe, and these principles will apply to almost all kinds of fishes. Uh, except that the rearing conditions, the rearing uh, uh, will change. And so when you start with the RAS project, first step is to choose a fish species. That's basically based on your local market survey and seed and feed locally availability of them. So based on that, and whether it is uh, like uh, the fishes, uh, uh, high value fishes are, at currently suitable for RS because of the cost operating costs involved in this compared to the other uh, system of uh, culture. So for example, then you need to understand once we choose the fish, we need to understand what is the water quality required for the fishes. Here I gave uh, two species, rainbow trout and tilapia. In general, we can generalize this uh, statement to maybe cold water and warm water. So for example, rainbow trout, the temperature range of 12 to 18 and dissolved oxygen. If you look into the, we need to grow the, uh, we need to grow fishes. So we need to provide dissolved oxygen for their growth of fishes that we need to maintain at least for rainbow trout, it is six to nine. In case in tilapia, it can go below up to four, four to six ppm or mg per liter. One has to be very uh, much important that the dissolved oxygen level in the outlet should not be less than 5 ppm in case of rainbow trout, but in case tilapia, it can go even below or near 3 ppm or parts per million. So the next is 
the major uh, metabolite which is toxic to fish is uh, ammonia. Uh, rainbow trouts are much sensitive, while tilapia are comparatively less sensitive to ammonia. And uh, we call, in fact, to avoid the confusion, we measure uh, ammonia in total ammonia nitrogen, both which includes both free and uh, ionized ammonia. So allowed, we take it a value, which is what is allowed ammonia or, or total ammonia nitrogen level is uh, for warm water, it is less than one uh, mg per liter. And in case of tilapia, it is less than three mg per liter. So in this way, you can see probably the rainbow trout has more stringent water quality. If you look into the TSS also, the total suspended solids uh, should not be crossing 20 mg per liter while in case of tilapia, it can go up to 30. So you can, from this itself, we can understand we need a more stringent system for rainbow trout, while tilapia can, even the lower stringent system can still work. So once we decide what species and what is the water, um, like what is the temperature, ideal temperature for their growth, what we need to understand is what is the mass balance or what is the dynamics, what we have to remove or what we have to add in the system. What is the treatment measure should be? So to, just to give an idea, in case here, I've taken an example of rainbow trout, a kg of fish uh, or kg of feed for rainbow trout, morally, mostly it will be around 40 to 45 percentage protein in the diet. When fed to rainbow trout, only 60 or 70 to 75 percent of the feed is uh, digested and rest is uh, excreted as fecal matter that is around 0.5 to 0.3 kg of feces are excreted. And to metabolize these feed, fish requires 0.3 kg of oxygen for every kg of feed. And the, in, during this process, they also excrete nearly 40 gram of ammonia per kg of feed. So, and as well as the carbon dioxide, around 0.4 kg of carbon dioxide. So this ammonia excretion, simply we can calculate multiplying the protein con concentration into the 0.292 factor. So we get how much roughly, this is a soft figure, I would say, soft number to calculate the how much ammonia is excreted per kg of uh, a feed. So he, here we can clearly see that we need to add feed in the system that because our objective is to grow fish and it also requires oxygen. And the two things we need to add is feed and oxygen. What we have to remove is ammonia, fecal solids and carbon dioxide. Now this is to produce uh, almost uh, to metabolize one kg of feed. Now we can calculate this too, uh, based on the production value we target, let's say one ton or 100 tons, or 50 tons, whatever. The oxygen, so once we understand how much oxygen is required or how much carbon dioxide we have to take out and how much sand, uh, one, other factor is that even nitrifying bacteria and nitrobacteria also requires oxygen and they also produce carbon dioxide. So we need to consider those, their uh, requirement also because they are also part of the system. So oxygen requirement on the other way, it also depends on the temperature and as well as the body size. So you can see clearly that uh, for rainbow trout at 15 degrees, which is optimal uh, temperature in growth, which varies from 400 to almost 200 mg oxygen per kg per hour of per kg of fish so as i said uh, we need to add oxygen we need to remove solids and we need to remove ammonia so accordingly many rs loop it's a generalized picture it will have a solid removing unit a biological filter a disinfection pumping and oxygenation or degassing system. We will be discussing every unit in individually. Of course, we need culture tank to grow the fish because there should be some vessel where we can uh, fill the water and allow the fish to grow. So choice of tank, uh, tank material or the tank is very important because most of the cost, almost 20% of the cost of uh, RAS installation is due to the, the tank material because um, you can choose wide variety of uh, materials starting from uh, FRP to the cement or even it depends on how much investment you put 
that that will decide which kind of time, uh, material and uh, how much long you want to do the project so we are using frp because it is durable and we can mold it to the shape we want so the shape of the tank is another main criteria most of the ras uh, prefers round shaped tanks why because it can remove the solids very quickly and there is very less maintenance in fact when it's a circular tank in case of raceway there is a lot of maintenance but then the circular tank there is a loss of space so the space coefficient usage is um, uh, poor in circular tank compared to the raceways so the people have come up with the new designs uh, use of octagonal tanks which compromise between raceway and uh, uh, circular tanks the yeah, size of the tank is if it is a commercial system it's good to have less number of tanks whereas large size tanks that will reduce a lot of manpower or labor required and the amount of water quality you need to perform so in that way the commercial system tank size varies from some, anywhere from 50 to 300 cubic meter but the small backyard system can have a small uh, tank also so the next is to remove solid because the once the fish is fed the next comes to the solid fecal matter so this can be removed by uh, two method three methods first is gravity separation filtration and flotations so this depends on the various sizes because the fecal matter which generated will be of various size they get break, broke uh, in the process of aeration and when they move from under the uh, inside the plumbing system when they move from the tank to solid removing system there will be a breakage happens and you will find various uh, sizes of uh, um, fecal uh, matter so we need to have more than one uh, solid removing system especially for high stocking density one of the advantage is that if you are using corner dual drain system that means this tank particularly has two drains. One is top drain, one is bottom drain. Nowadays, the feed formulations for recirculating aquaculture is increasingly uh, emphasizing on more of decantation drain. That means to settling the most of the fecal matter. So improve the density of uh, fecal matter so that most of the fecal matter can settle and we can remove that from by just by settling them. So if this if you design a uh, dual drain tank, what is the advantage is that we, uh, most of the solids we can separate in just 20% of the bottom flow. The flow regimes are suggested in such a way that the bottom flow is only 20% and the top flow is 80%. So most of the settleable solids we can separate it using a small radial flow settler or spiral separator in nothing but a small settling tank with a appropriately shaped to enhance the settling ability of the solids. So this kind of uh, systems can be used uh, to reduce the, the drum filter required, uh, the size of the drum filter required, and in fact, to in enhance the ability of solid, solid removal. Another uh, model is also available, that is EcoTrap, which can remove, uh, in fact, this 50%, more than 50% of the solid waste in just 5% of the central integrated the drain so basically it has the large tank has a triple drain whereas the small tanks will have two drains both the uh, drains will be uh, centrally integrated with this kind of uh, eco trap we can uh, reduce the requirement of uh, other solid removing uh, systems significantly by ready then which will in fact reduce the cost of insulation for drum filter or uh, the foam fractionator. And this kind of system is supplied by Scale AQ, uh, the company, a Norwegian company. The next is most of the ones and most of the satellite solids are removed, then uh, it is mostly passed through kind of some kind of screen. So mostly uh, currently people are using uh, drums or screen filter or otherwise it's called rotating drum screen filter, which is nothing but a uh, screen mesh which is shaped in the form of drum or uh, and the water is made to pass through that the size of this uh, mesh anything varies from 30 to 60 micron and these kind of systems which can, can remove particles up to 30 micron 
and there is a since since this is an automatic process because there is an automatic back wash mechanism also can be made where uh, because as more and more solids trap in the system the water level rises this water level rise uh, we can sense it and trigger the backwash mechanism to clean the drums repeatedly so in this way this is completely automatic system commercial units definitely require such kind of system because uh, this system will reduce a lot of manual cost uh, to remove very fine solids foam fractioners or protein skimmers are used especially uh, they are used in seawater rs because they are only efficient in uh, seawater rs and freshwater foam fractions are recently available with ozone injection but the efficiency is not that same as that of seawater so but these can these uh, foam fractionates can remove very fine solids once the solids are removed the next step is to remove the nitrogen extractory products or simply ammonia ammonia is uh, major nitrogen excretory product which is excreted through gills mainly free ammonia is only toxic because uh, they exist in two form which we call is total ammonia nitrogen which is nh3 plus nh4 ion and these uh, both fractions are ph and temperature dependent that means uh, there is a very good relationship between them uh, as a ph increases that is the basic pH is the free ammonia concentration increases and as the acidic pH the, the ionized forming uh, ammonia increases. So basically what happens is that the only free ammonia is toxic. Why? Because the only free form of ammonia can enter through the uh, gill of fish. That's why it is toxic. And we can, uh, we take a, a low tan level of one and three for warm and cold water, uh, sorry, cold and warm, warm water RAs. Or design consideration. In fact, uh, RS also utilizes a natural nitrifying microorganism for removing ammonia from water through a uh, two-step process. Basically, in the current some of the version people use the electrochemical way uh, also to remove ammonia. But then mostly in the most RS, they, it is dependent on the uh, natural nitrifying microorganisms. There are two kinds of microorganisms. One is uh, which act Nitroso um, ammonia oxidizing bacteria and nitri nit nitrite oxidizing bacteria. So initial first step they convert ammonia to nitrite and the second step they convert nitrite to nitrate. So these generally they uh, they are catalyzed by two kind of organism. But recent studies suggest that this can also be done by single kind of organism like Nitrospira. For such kind of bacteria are called Comamox. So if you look into the complete nitrification cycle, so they also require oxygen and alkalinity. So for every ammonia oxidized, they require around four gram of oxygen and seven gram of alkalinity. So these will be limiting factors. So this also decides our quality consideration for the source water. So we need to maintain the alkalinity above 100 ppm for optimum nitrification to happen. So Either you need to have a very good alkalinity in your source water or we need to adjust with addition of calcium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate or simply uh, baking soda. So the thumb rule is that for every kg of feed fed in an intensive system, we need to add 0.25 kg of sodium bicarbonate. So the aim of biological filter is nothing but to improve the surface area which will enhance the growth of uh, nitrifying bacteria, basically, and provide a suitable environment for their growth. So there are different kinds of media uh, or filters are used. So it can be bead filter where beads, uh, microplastic beads, uh, are used as a media for growth of bacteria. <clears throat> Rotating biological contractor is another kind of uh, 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 biological filter which used to you, which have been used earlier. Now it is not much. Nowadays, mostly people are using moving bed biofilters because it has no uh, maintenance because they are kept in suspension through aeration in water in a tank, and the water is passed through. So different kinds of plastic medias are used. Either it is a K1 media and K5 media because they are engineering designed 
such a way that they enhance the surface area of uh, for growth of bacteria and similarly very simple gravel also can be used as a biological uh, media for growth of microorganisms in most cold water sectors like in especially for uh, rainbow trout and salmon fluidized sand biofilters are used where tank is filled with sand and the water the velocity of water in such a way that the sand expands in certain level and since the sand has enormous surface area a lot of uh, uh, we require the the, the full rate of bio uh, this biological filter is required is very less but there is one problem with such kind of system is that as the time passes uh, the size of this gravel increases because of the growth of uh, bacteria and the, they come out sometimes they start coming out of the tank to the culture tanks so regular replacement of sand is required from the top layer and uh, when you set up an ras it also requires some time for uh, biofilter to stop so it requires almost a month to start uh, biofilter to fully function so for this we can also simultaneously we, we can perform fishless cycle by adding ammonia directly in the water before stocking the fishes in fact and this will reduce the time required for biofilter to mature and other ways we can inoculate uh, nitrifying uh, bacteria also so based on this curve we can see it takes almost 35 days uh, to reduce the ammonia and nitrate level near zero so probably if you are performing a fishless cycle this is the time to 35 days is the time where we should start stocking fishes yes we uh, oxygen is very essential because for the growth of fishes so that is the uh, our dissolved oxygen is in fact is the major factor which limits uh, increasing carry capacity as well as uh, the production intensification and our uh, dissolved oxygen is the prime factor which if some sudden death is happening is mainly due to dissolved oxygen in kind of uh, mainly high stocking density because within uh, 10 to 15 minutes we can we may lose fish if any uh, oxygen supply system fails so we can perform aeration that is using either blowers or several kinds of blowers are available ring blowers or root blowers or even diaphragm blowers which are highly energy efficient but they are expensive aeration is nothing but we are just bubbling the atmospheric air into water through the help of diffusers with this kind of uh, operations we can only support only maximum 40 kg fish per cubic meter of uh, water and uh, there is advan other advantage with aeration is that of course we cannot increase the stocking density more than 40 kg per cubic meter but then it has advantage that we can remove strip off the carbon dioxide which is uh, present which build up in the water which is generally is not an issue when we are using aeration but then this is a issue when we are using pure oxygen so pure oxygen also can be used uh, but is and it is very essential to improve when you, if you want stocking density above 40 kg per meter, cubic meter pure oxygen can be either compressed or liquid oxygen also can be used nowadays uh, there is a lot of uh, on site um, oxygen generator based on uh, pressure absorption technology or vacuum absorption technology is available so they can produce oxygen at on site and but then these are not diffused in the water because uh, the efficiency of diffusion is very low so what we generally is do is either they are passed through oxygen core they are injected in oxygen core on our low head oxygen uh, low head oxygenators which uh, oxygen cone generally has a very good designed oxygen cone will provide 90% uh, transfer efficiency the second step is uh, disinfection because there since we are recirculating the water repeatedly there is uh, there will be growth of heterotrophic bacteria as well as there can be chances of pathogenic bacterial uh, load which need to be controlled through a process of disinfection in commercial systems generally ozones are uh, is a good source uh, around 3 300 milli volt of orp is the ideal dose uh, oxygen uh, ozone for freshwater ras especially in the cold water ras so you can see they also have many advantage they improve the water clarity 
clearly you can see the with ozone without ozone there is a lot of difference because they also oxidize loss a lot of uh, um, organic matter and even they help in improving the biological filter efficiency because they also oxidize nitrite to nitrate and also reduce the BOD. Uh, generally when ozone is used they are uh, also used along with UV light because if there is any excess ozone that can also harm fish because anything ozone in, com com uh, in contact it oxidizes them. So normally when you pass the ozonated water through UV light the ozone um, is break down into uh, oxygen so generally when after ozone UV filters are also given. So commercial system utilizes both ozone and UV disinfectants. So this is an one, one of the examples when you assemble all the equipments, uh, including solid uh, culture tank to solid separators to biofilter and degassing uh, or degassing as well as oxygenator. This the, the system will look something like this. This is a system from a Freshwater Institute of USA, which they uh, they're working uh, more than 30 years on these, improving the RAs. And we have started working from last three years on this, um, uh, on a pilot RAs production scale, which has around uh, seven meter cube of four tanks, a total system volume of 30, uh, 50 meter cube, cubic meter. And in the last cycle, uh, we are able to uh, produce almost 1,200 kg of fish within six months in a small rearing where volume of almost 24 cubic meter. So if you look into the production cost, because the economics is ultimately which uh, decides whether you need to do it or not. So the production cost, if you look into it, is almost 150 rupees due to feed. That is the same, can we in other, uh, in closed system, this can be a little bit higher. But since the feed efficiency is better in RAS, the cost is only 150 rupees per kg fish produced. But then there is the extra cost which is added is electricity, which is almost to produce in our system, which uh, accounts for almost 15 units of electricity is required to produce a kg of fish. And it, it accounts almost 76 rupees at the cost of 5 rupees uh, per unit of electricity. So other seed cost and uh, we require some water quality analysis kit and of course bicarbonate ions. So it comes around almost 250 rupees per kg, excluding labor of course. Uh, the cost of production is 250 and fishes are sold at 500 rupees per kg. So we can achieve almost a 50 percentage uh, um, profit over the, over the over production cost. But then there is one more thing is that of course the, we need to establish an RA system which also in, in, incurs a lot of fixed cost. So the, the system which we, we have uh, established, uh, which is costing around 23 lakhs, uh, the cost of only the production system I'm considered because it, the system also has the experimental units. So when you consider only the production unit, it is counting for around 23 lakhs nearly. And the operating cost of almost 3.2 lakhs every crop. With the stocking density, we are able to achieve uh, maximum stocking density. We are able to achieve was 40 kg meter cube. We produced nearly around 1,200 kg fishes, uh, sold at 500 rupees, uh, achieved 6 lakh total revenue, and net profit was 2.7 2. lakhs. Almost 50%, nearly 50% of the production cost was as a profit. But then there is an issue here is the break even point because there is a lot of investment and this basically. Because of the scale of operation, also one of the issues, because this is a very small scale operation. A commercial scale, somebody want to, it should be not less than anything less than 20 tons of production. So with that scale, we we can uh, definitely, we are very sure that the, the production, everything, you, whatever the investment, you can get it within two years. So as I said, this there is a high initial investment and high energy cost. So in this way, our uh, government is supporting a lot to reduce the burden on initial investment through PMSSY schemes. So in that way, I feel this will be economical. The whole process will be economical. But then there are some other issues associated with RS, uh, which are uh, which need to be considered before we uh, go to start an RS business. That will be also covered in the next presentation in detail. Um, 
yes one of the issue is that we require continuous supply of electricity even 10 to 15 minutes uh, power failure can we might lose everything so backup is very important and uh, backup for even for oxygen supply is very important because they are the first few parameters which affect the total success or failure of the system so that this because of this only the, the initial cost is high compared to a flow through traditional flow through system it is almost the initial investment of ras for rainbow trout at least it is five times higher than uh, the traditional flow through system but then with the uh, with the scale and the government support definitely this can be overcome this is uh, the scale uh, this, uh, the, whatever I explained as of now is for, especially for the farmers which uh, were able to do, who can take a little bit risk, um, uh, invest a little bit of money. But then there are farmers or entrepreneurs who want to do it in a small scale or a backyard scale, not investing much. So in that house line also we, we worked, we developed a few models for a small scale farmers also. One is small three meter cube backyard model and one a small scale production model also of seven meter cubic meter. So these are the fish weighing and uh, we can see some of the, the growth rates. The weight gains, you can see within uh, six months, six plus months, we are able to get more than 350 grams. And we are able to achieve in this system up to 50 kg per cubic meter initial days. Uh, uh, but then that we cannot achieve as uh, we found it that uh, going beyond 30, as an issue because it increase, improves, uh, I mean, increases a lot of turbidity in water. So we had to really decrease the stocking density to 30. So you can see the one of the reasons why the growth rate was low because the temperature was dropping. We did not maintain uh, temperature in this system. We allowed what naturally presents. And one of the important parameter I want to say is that uh, many uh, farmers which do not uh, consider or do not uh, it's not to explain because you, if you can clearly see the pH initial 100 days, you can see there are drop in pH because as I said, the nitrification process utilizes alkalinity and the pH drops. So we can see the pH dropping up to 6 in initial days. And later on, we adjusted with the addition of sodium bicarbonate. Uh, for every kg of feed, we added around 150 gram of sodium bicarbonate so that we can, we can see there is a clarity between, uh, there is a clear, uh, stable, uh, pH uh, between 7.8 to 8. and this the same uh, you can observe in uh, alkalinity also. Once we started adding alkalinity, we all uh, we are able to maintain above 100. So alkalinity addition is very important in uh, RAS when your source water has very low alkalinity or less than 100, and when your hydraulic retention time or the the exchange rate. I mean to say how much new water you add if it is very less, then the sodium bicarbonate addition is very important that has to be considered. And if you look into this uh, economic feasibility of this small system, uh, the small system costed around 1,25,000 to install. Uh, we use the FRP tanks. That's why the cost is literally high. People can use even, uh, there are a lot of uh, bioflock related the plastic tanks, which can be cheaper. And the other thing is we also included the power backup for system for this to be more safer. So we find it that within three to two crops, we can get uh, the, all the money back. So if you look into the water requirement, interesting factor is the water required. So earlier people thought, okay, the fish farming requires big ponds or a huge amount of land or a huge amount of water. But now people are increasingly realizing that, okay, we can farm our own fish in our backyard, mainly because the water required to produce the kg of fish has reduced by such kind of system. Uh, it is almost 900 to 1000 liter. Uh, that means that is the that's the water water is required and this water is also not based actually because this water is nutrient rich which is rich in nitrite and phosphorus and other minerals so which can be used for uh, other uh, agricultural practices or uh, gardening or even for connected to aquaponics and the energy required is one of the still an issue we are working on that um, but say so it is not an issue for economical operation but we can reduce this energy required uh, with the various uh, changes in uh, pumping system and uh, aeration. So if you look into the commercial, compared to the commercial systems, uh, for example, in salmonids, which varies from 0.3 to 
cubic meter per kg pro uh, fish produce. This system utilizes uh, denitrifiers to reduce the, uh, the water exchange rate. And energy use in commercial system varies from anywhere from 5 kilowatt to 25 kilowatt hour. And uh, with this, I conclude my presentation with the, uh, if any further content, uh, like further information is required, you can also refer, actually, there's a very nice book uh, written by Timmons Enabling, and there's a second version of this book is available um, by Freshwater Institute USA. And also you can contact me. Um, you can write to me for any further information. And whatever the questions, if you have any, you can uh, also share in chat box. We will take up those questions in the end of the presentation. So uh, with this, uh, we will move on to the next session. Um, I welcome uh, Dr. Biju for uh, taking the next session. Um, okay. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Uh, so I think like uh, Dr. Rajesh made all the basics pretty very comprehensive and clear. So like I won't be going into the area that he was presenting, but I'll be trying to summarize uh, some of the standard operating protocols because this is another very important aspect. One is the design aspect and the second is the operational aspect. So I would like to uh, give you a brief idea about standard operating protocols of a recirculating aquaculture system based on our I mean, personal experience with our own uh, experimental facility, what we have here. And I'll just simplify the thing a little bit for those who are starting up with RAs uh, by giving a little bit of a comparative understanding with humans. So uh, there is a lot of similarities between the human body and RAS systems, like the recirculating aquaculture systems, if we want to compare and analyze. The first thing if you see is like for us, like we have different organ systems. So if we take our integumentary system or the skins and follicles and hair that we have, this is more or like a first defensive mechanism, again, any external things that comes and affects us. The similar way in RAS, RAS enclosures are so important. And um, normally for more control over all the, I mean, production variables, like uh, closed RAS is preferred, but like even uh, open RA systems are there, but then this serves as the primary defense mechanism. A good RAS enclosure is very important. And the second thing that we have to, you, we can see is that like, you know, the rearing tanks in which we culture the fish, we can consider it or equate it along with the musculoskeletal system because it gives a framework and then like the muscles build up within that. And then if you look into the circulatory system, very similar to our heart and the arteries and the veins, like uh, Nares, the most important thing is a water pump where it has to ensure that the water is being continuously recirculated without any stoppage. And then like the plumbings, which is connecting the RA systems to the rearing tanks and all the filtration units is very important. And then if you look like we have the respiratory system and similar to the respiratory system in our body, we have the oxygenators like a pure oxygen injection or even aeration systems and degasses to remove carbon dioxide. So these are the systems which almost similarly functions or parallelly functions similar to our respiratory system. And then we have our mechanical and biological filtration units as uh, Dr. Rajesh elaborated upon all these things. I won't go into the details, but like I'll just summarize like an equate. Like, so basically their function is that like they uh, serve to digest what are the toxic compounds which is produced and excrete them out of the system or remove it out of the system. So the system keeps on functioning normally. And if you look into, again, like if we have control panels, a main control panel, we have a lot of electrical wiring because electricity is another very important thing. It's more or less like the neurons which are signaling and running our body. And then like regulators to, you know, like uh, switch on or switch off machines. So this is equivalent to the nervous and endocrine system in the human body. 
And if you look like, again, one important thing to avoid diseases or any pathogen incidences like is lymphatic and immune system. And if you see in RAS, we have UV filtration and ozone generators, which basically functions to eliminate all the pathogens and keep your system disease free. And then sensory systems, we have different sensory organs like through which we sense and know what is exactly happening in our external environment. And in RAS, similarly, we use water quality and fish monitoring systems, which tells us exactly what's happening underwater or in the entire system in the RAS loop. And then in humans, we have reproductive system to produce offspring and go forward. Whereas in an RAS, if you consider, like if the system or the operation is profitable and the production, what we intend to take is happening, the cycles keep on going repeatedly. So uh, these are a lot of similarities. So the similarities doesn't end here. Like these are just the components which I want to relate with the organ systems. And if you go a little further into it, we can see that like, you know, for humans, basically, uh, if a human is functional, like the functional status of a human being is assessed by activities of daily living, clinical diagnosis terms, whether that human is able to feed themselves very properly, whether they are able to dress themselves, whether they are able to wash themselves, whether they're going to uh, go to the washroom, they're able to move and whether they can transfer themselves to one place or another and progress. So like, this is the activities of daily living and this is very clearly linked to the RS operations as well. If we look at it, feed management. So like we choose, like a, as we choose what to eat, how much to eat, and that benefits or, you know, harms our body. The same way, feed management practices, the diet we choose, the composition of the feed, the feeding ration, the feeding frequency, everything is going to affect the entire system's work. And then similarly dressing, like for example, when our dress gets dirty, like we exchange it, we just pour it and take a new dress. So water exchange also is basically, we do in a similar way, like when we know that the water quality is going to a certain extent, we have to exchange it so to keep the conditions optimal. And then that also prevents it from external influences or like anything that comes. So by security measures also, we can count in as the dressing thing and washing. So one important thing is that like as we clean ourselves uh, regularly, the system has to be cleaned and maintained. And that's a very important thing of the standard operating procedure. Uh, so another thing is that um, excretion, like our like, excretion is again, a very important function of RAs. Like so uh, basically if you want to equate like you know like it's more or less like our digestive and urinary system i mean excretory system so this is something another important thing which we have to monitor and make sure that it is happening in the right way to ensure that there is no toxic substance accumulation in the RA system and mobility if you see there are two major phases which continuously two things which flow through the system one is water and another is electricity and any of this stops the system is going to stop so we should ensure on a daily basis, the water flow and electricity is clearly going to every individual component of the system. And another thing that we see is biomass monitoring and management. And uh, this is something that we can equate with transferring like ourselves, like our physical body from one place to another. So like we stock, we harvest, we monitor the growth curve and we manage the entire thing. So this is something like with clinical diagnosis, we can you know equate the standard operating procedures of an RIS operation also. And again, like if we see, like, for example, when we go to a doctor, the doctor starts his diagnosis of the system based on certain things. First thing is a visual observation. He sees like whether any external or anything is abnormal with the system. And then they look into the life vitals, like they say, um, for example, our pulse, our heart rate and all these things, temperature. So similarly, NARA system also, the standard operating procedures begins like that. So we have to have a daily task of this visual observation and monitoring of the RS vitals is what uh, we can call it. So in terms of visual observations, the first thing that we can do here on an everyday basis and like, I mean, within the day even, is to see that like, what is the turbidity and transparency level in the RS system? So if the water is more turbid, that means that like the filtration is not efficient or like it's not performing to the capacity and that's going to limit the production. So we need to be careful with that. And the second thing is we can just observe like whether the water level in the rear units and the sump and everything is in the right condition. So that is another thing. And flow rate, we have to keep on looking. We should, uh, like flow rate monitors are also there and we can visually also see if there is any change, drastic changes in the flow rate. Uh, water flow rate into the tanks. And then another thing, solid removal we can observe. We can see if there is any solid accumulation in the bottom of the tank or we can even look into our mechanical filtration units to see whether solid removal is happening in a very proper way. So these are daily tasks which we should be doing as per the standard operating protocol. And another thing is that like 
fish swimming dikh rahe we have to look into how the fish is swimming any abnormal swimming any lateral swimming is it is not stable and like or if it is not swimming and it's resting so these are all indicators of stress or infection so we need to be very clear about that and then whenever we are feeding that's another very good point of seeing if the fish is in good condition so if the fish is feeding normally like there is uh we we have a confirmation that all the components of the rs is working well and the fish is okay there if the fish feeding is getting affected and it's getting reduced we can see that either the water quality or any of the components is having an issue so this is another thing we have to main, measure on a daily basis an external signs of infection any external signs in the body or any stressful symptoms where it goes scratches so all these things we we have to keep on monitoring and these are visually done without any tools basically and there are the second classes like where we need some you know as like we need kits or uh, you know tools or even like an advanced system we have real time monitoring units which keeps on monitoring connected to a scada system or a logic program control and it keeps on transmitting data to us so in that sense if you see as uh, dr rajesh put it this all oxygen concentration is the primary limiting factor so we should be measuring this on a daily basis and the best thing is if we can measure it on a continuous basis that is even better and then we should be knowing what is the temperature in the system what's the ph and alkalinity in the system because he clearly explained what is the significance i'll get into those details as we go to the water quality monitoring also and then another important thing is to see carbon dioxide levels how it is and total suspended solids because these are indicators for example total suspended solids if it is increasing that means a solid removal is not happening well and mechanical filtration has an issue so we need to sort it out and on a daily basis we need to follow the nitrogen cycle also to ensure that there is no accumulation of toxic ammonia in the system because the accumulation of toxic ammonia within that volume of water in which we are considering high density of fishes can really harm the fishes so we need to make sure that the nitrogen cycle is working very well and the second thing what we have to ensure uh with either tools or any particular assist is that like we need to make sure that the water pumps and motors are working well and on a daily basis we need to also check the alarm systems that we have kept and the emergency backups that we have kept that they are operationally ready like any issue happens it should be immediately started so that we need to make sure on a daily basis that these things are like well in place and then another important thing which normally is applicable to any farming system it's not only rs but in rs it's even more important because uh, it's a high intensity system where like the monitoring of vitals and recording it becomes a very important thing to just diagnose any or predict what is going to happen even you know so record keeping becomes very important and cycle to cycle comparisons like because in rs we can take short production cycles as dr rajesh was telling within uh, you know like 6 to 8 months we can have a crop compared to a flow through race way where like we have to wait for 12 to 16 months so if we can do that like then like we need a strong record keeping to compare like what is happening between the different cycles so that that gives us a clear idea of how to predict and go about and for that like for example what all records we have to keep it on a daily basis so water quality in this is what we are measuring should be recorded and how much water we are exchanging should be recorded to know that the how much water budget or like water footprint is the ra system is taking in and then we need to have a daily record clear record of how much fish size number biomass we have it's not to measure but we can predict it like based on monthly measurements or a weekly measurement like of representative samples and then like we should be knowing the growth rate like this also should be recorded if not on a daily basis it should be recorded on a three week basis or a monthly basis so that we know that the production is happening as we want it to happen and then like we i also have to record how much of feed is being used in the system because feed usage is a clear indicator of you know how much we can you know work around the carrying capacity of the system we use more feed or put in more feed like we are going to load the filtration uh, mechanism so we need to be very careful about that and any deformity mortality or disease occurrence should be recorded so that we can take preventive actions or quick remedial actions so we need to be very careful about this and then another thing that we have to record and keep a very clear record is electricity usage because we have to refine it and optimize it with every cycle the less electricity we use with every small corrections that we do in our rs loop that's going to increase the profit margin so again like what is the production productivity we have to record to just you know compare within cycle or between cycles the production cycles and expenditure and revenue normally the financial statements are you know it's good to maintain in any you know like economic activity so record keeping is also a must it, it's either a daily task or a monthly task you you can just see like how it is best done 
and a little bit to go individually into the ideas. Like, for example, the first thing that we need to think about in a system is how much to stock, you know, like what size to stock. These are the first questions that come. So the what size to stock, if we ask the questions, that is mainly dependent on the outlet design. Like we need to make sure that the fish doesn't escape from the rearing unit and gets into the other filtration components because it will die in the process. So we need to ensure that the size is above the drain size, okay? So normally in our system, we just stock 20 to 30 grams so that like, you know, the fishes are retained and they have a good growth there. So like stocking size sizes depend on the outlet design of the system. And stocking number has multiple factors which we need to clearly consider. It's not only about the initial size and the initial, you know, like uh, stocking density. What we have to keep in mind is what will be my final productivity? What will be my final harvest size? Based on that, the stocking number should be decided. Like for example, uh, we have a seven meter cube tank. And like, for example, if we plan to take like, you know, 500 grams of fish, we can say stock like 600 fishes, 2000 fishes. But then like if we, 600 fishes we have to stock. And if we have to expect that like, I'm going to take a final harvest size of one kg, then I need to go for 300 fishes and not 600 fishes. So the stocking numbers will be dependent on the harvest size, the productivity that we are targeting and the system allows what it allows, the filtration mechanism that we have and the load that it can handle. And what will be the oxygen demand of the biomass which will be there in the tank. So these are the major concerns in which using which we just really decide the stocking number. And another thing is we need to be very clear about the stocking schedules. So like, you know, whether I'm having an annual crop, okay, so we, we should have a clear production plan. So we need to know like whether I'm going to do an annual crop or a multiple crop within a year. And according to that, I need to, you know, do we can do cold banking, like, you know, stunting some fishes and just stocking every three months or like stocking every six months. So this decision should be there in the production plan. And then again, another thing is that like we should have uh, the best thing with an RS is to do multi-phase stocking and multiple harvesting. The reason being like the carrying capacity can be best used or the efficiency of the RS can be best used like when we are doing a multi-phase stocking and harvesting. And another thing, important thing is that like we need to monitor the growth curve and the survival of the animals to know exactly what's happening with the biomass that we are holding. So for example, in this graph that we see, like we can clearly see like Prediction curves is already available. Like for example, in rainbow trout, we know how uh, it grows normally over a production cycle. So like using a template of that, we can plot our observations. So every representative sampling that we do, we can plot it against the predicted growth and see what is the, how the observed growth is, you know, matching up with the predicted growth. So for example, if my predicted growth should be there and my the uh, absurd growth is down here, like there is something really wrong with my system and that's going to affect the profitability. So we need to rectify that. So this is another important thing. And for biosecurity purpose and traceability purpose, it's good to isolate cohorts. When you are doing multiple stocking and you know harvesting, we need to make sure that one you know particular cohort or one particular batch goes into a tank so that we can trace that throughout the production cycle as well as we can maintain proper biosecurity measures. In advanced RA systems where we are talking about say more than 100 kg of production, like machine vision systems does all these things. There are artificial intelligent tools which is presently available. Like for example, one example that I can give you is observed technologies. So they can really identify each individual fish based on the body patterns and the body structure. And they can just plot the fish weight without handling, without taking out the fishes or doing any sampling. These things are coming up. So in RAs, like these are going to be the future of RAs. And coming next to the monitoring control, uh, we ensure that the production is happening according to what we plan. So for example, like we do a daily exchange of water, okay? So like, how do we decide how much of water to exchange? Just can we do it randomly? So there are certain, you know, calculations for that. Like, and what we can assume safely is that when with a very basic system and we don't have a denitrifier and things to remove nitrate and the end products of the, you know, uh, nitrogen cycle, what we can keep is that like for every kg of feed that we are adding into the system, 1000 liter of water should be exchanged, right? Like, so if you are adding, say like uh, 5 kg of feed into the system per day, it's better to, you know, replace 5000 liter of water. So that is the calculation that we have to keep in mind. If I have a denitrifier also where nitrate can be converted into nitrogen and removed, then like probably the water volume that we have to exchange can be even brought low as 300 liters. So this is something that we need to keep in our mind. 
And the second thing is that like um, for nitrogen cycle to happen, alkalinity adjustment is very important. As Dr. Rajesh was telling, alkalinity, we need to keep it in the range of say like 100 milligram per liter for a safer, you know, like operation of the nitrogen cycle. And uh, for example, with carbon dioxide being released, so he explained the mass balance very clearly. So with the carbon dioxide being released, pH will go down. So like we need to control it and keep the pH in the right level so that the nitrogen cycle keeps going very well. So again, for that reason, like as he was pointing out, like we can clearly do this pH station, they say, like which measures the pH and continuously adjust the pH in the system. That can be done by adding 250 gram of sodium bicarbonate or like in commonly baking soda. We can add 250 gram for every kg of feed that we are adding into the system to keep the pH like in the favorable region or in the optimal region. And then like, for example, suddenly like a uh, bifilter is not working to its efficiency and we find a high ammonia load in the system. So how do we tackle that like in a standard operating procedure? The first thing that we can do is we can stop feeding so that new ammonia load doesn't happen. Okay, we are stopping ammonia loading into the system. And then another thing that we can do is we can add zeolite. Okay, zeolite is a compound like which will, you know, through ion exchange minimize ammonia okay in the system so this is one thing that we can do otherwise or if you find out that like you know there is an issue with the bifilter like we can add some you know microbes or microbial consortium which is now commercially even coming products like nova q and others are coming and if for example the first step of the nitrogen cycle is happening i mean ammonia oxidation is happening and then like the second step is not happening so nitrate level is going up so what can we do so there like again like we can add sodium chloride so for example you know um, how do we tackle nitrate levels is that like the chloride ions can bind to the nitrate and just you know make it uh, less toxic so uh, what we have to see is that like if one milligram per liter of nitrate is there, like we have to at least add 25 milligram per liter of sodium chloride so that like nitrate toxicity is balanced up. Otherwise, if there is a nitrate buildup, what happens is that like we all know like brown blood disease happens, okay? The nitrate goes and binds with the hemoglobin, makes methemoglobin and like brown blood disease happens. So this is something that we need to uh, follow. And then uh, what about the next step? Like uh, some things sometimes when you are not really following up the biomass monitoring, a low oxygen can happen or a high carbon dioxide uh, values can show up. So in that case, like the best solution is that we can aerate, okay? Aeration avoids carbon dioxide accumulation. And to a certain extent, it just prevents oxygen drop. But then like if you are injecting pure oxygen, that really can, you know, like rectify the oxygen deficit. Or like one thing that we can do for immediate thing, either for ammonia nitrate as well as the oxygen carbon dioxide is water exchange we can do. And then like if there is a high temperature suddenly, like uh, there's a problem with the thermostat or like if you don't have it, how do we maintain that when a temperature goes higher? We have to increase the aeration. Like uh, there are studies which tell us that like if more oxygen is given, even at super saturation levels, instead of 90%, 100%, we give it 120%. Even in our own system, Dr. Rajesh had worked out a few components with oxygenation where like by increasing oxygen content, like we have seen that like, you know, high temperatures, negative effect can be minimized. So this can be uh, seen. And then otherwise we can use industrial process chillers to keep the temperature constant, which is happening in a very sophisticated manner. We can control temperature. So this is another thing. And high solid loads, suddenly we are seeing that the total suspended solids in the system is getting high. So what to check, how to manage. So the first thing what you have to check is the mechanical filtration, whether the screens are, screens are proper, is it clogged, or if my cyclones and the sediment, uh, sedimentation units are not working well, the water flow to them is not right. So in that sense, like we need to clean the mechanical filters and just make sure that the solid removal is happening. And another thing is we need to check feed quality. If the feed comes with a lot of fines, we need to screen them and remove the fines. Or if the feed composition is not good, like I'll go into the details, that also we need to really rectify that. So these are things which we have to do for uh, dealing with high solids load. And then another thing is that uh, we need to make sure when we are uh, monitoring water quality, you know, the equipment that we are using or the devices that we are using cannot be always, you know, giving the right value. So periodically, the standard operating procedure is need, we need to calibrate the equipment and make sure that it is giving the precise values. And these equipments, if it is connected to an alarm system and an emergency system, so automatically, you know, it can help. So for example, we have also a real-time monitoring system from YSI. So basically what we can get is we can get alarms through those systems. And like, if we have a control unit integrated with the SCADA system, like of the computerized system, like we can automatically switch on regulators when oxygen drops, oxygen delivery, or the aerators can be switched on, more oxygen will be given to the system. Something like that, we can arrange it in a highly intensive RS systems, right? 
And then another thing that we need to have in our mind is that like we are reducing the water use per kilogram by a huge amount. So when we are using only 1000 kgs or less than that for producing 1 kg of fish, we should understand there will be accumulation of a lot of organic and inorganic compounds. For example, metal accumulation. If you are using uh, steel pipes or copper pipes, in any of the system, like these metals can be keeping on accumulating in the system. And we need to avoid that. Otherwise, that metal toxicity will start affecting the fish growth. Or like if you're not creating, I mean, cleaning the biofilter properly, the organic load, if it is not removed properly, somewhere if it is going and settling, this organic matter's decomposition can start producing hydrogen sulfide, which will affect the system or the fishes. So we need to be careful. Or like, again, if this organic matter is there, like, and there is other you know, bacterial growth, like cyanobacterial growth, what happens is that like products like off flavor substances like geosmin and methyl isoborneal comes into play. And uh, that can really, you know, impair the quality of the product that we are producing. So we need to be very careful to avoid these things. So in the standard operating procedure, the first thing is just we had some solutions for what to do when something happens. But then a regular monitoring and cleaning schedule of all RAS components should be planned and put in place. So we cannot give a generalization here because one size doesn't fit to all the systems. So based on the size in which we operate, we need to maintain a regular monitoring, what to monitor on a daily basis, what to monitor on a weekly basis. We need to schedule it. So what to clean it on a daily basis, what to do it on a weekly basis or monthly basis. We need to schedule it and do it, ensure that that is done so that the production cycle is not affected. And then like uh, coming to another important aspect, a feed can really play a major role in uh, you know, the profitability and the production efficiency of an RAS. Because like uh, unlike extensive systems or even in a semi-intensive system, like we cannot give a sub quality feed there because one thing is lesser the crop cycle, the more energy efficient the system will be, less resources we'll be using and the production efficiency and profitability will be high. So we need to give, can you see if it is over? Yeah, yeah. Sorry for the resonance. Yeah. So, uh, so the feed what we are giving in RS should be nutritionally complete. It cannot be subpar. Like we should meet the nutritional requirements of the fish in its entirety. So we cannot expect that something else will be meeting. Otherwise, the crop cycle will be extended and our profitability margin will go down. And another thing that we need to keep very much in mind is that the feed composition and the physical quality plays a major role in how much production we can take out of the system. Because if there is loose feces, the particles, the feces gets broken up, there will be a lot of turbidity. When there is more turbidity and the filtration system is not really working well, we cannot really expect the fishes to grow because the conditions, you know, like in which it prefers to grow, the optimal conditions we won't be able to give. So this is something we call as fecal, uh, I mean, fecal decantation, you know, like our, uh, in dietary terms, we say as high fecal decantation diets. So like we need to ensure that there are certain ingredients that we put in the feed. Like so RS feeds and the other feeds are totally different. So even for us, just to give you an example, we experience this. Like for example, when we use smaller size feed particles, say like 1.2 mm, 1.8 mm, where the expansion ratio is very less, like we don't see that like, you know, we see that the solid removal is really good. And as the feed size increases to three to six mm, when it goes to six mm particularly, when the expansion rate is more, like if those feeds are mainly meant to be fed to the raceway systems, what happens is that the feces gets broken up. And when the feces gets broken up, that actually decreases the growth performance of the fish. So this is based on our own observation. So uh, in this case, RAS needs specific feeds where like the, it ensures with binders, with specific, you know, like even ingredients like wheat gluten that we add to, you know, make the feces more intact and we remove the feces as such so that the load on the filtration systems as it goes through the different filtration components will be less. And one thing that we need to always remember is that low quality feed will, this, will definitely spoil water quality. So for example, to give you an example, in one RA system, we are using a pelleted feed. Another RA system, we are using an extruded feed. Pelleted feed naturally has very less binding. 
so what basically it happens is that like that feed like will disintegrate in the system so feed wastage will be there and fecal wastage will be more so that that disintegration will spoil the water quality uh, in case of like more intact feeds like more physical properties when it is really good like that can be avoided and another thing in an ra system which we need to definitely avoid is underfeeding and overfeeding so here basically in this graph we can see like for example underfeeding is also not going to serve the purpose because growth rate is going to be bad as well as feed use is not going to be good and then even at higher levels when you are going to you know ad libitum feeding okay maintenance level feeding or ad libitum feeding also growth may be higher but you know feed conversion will become higher too and this will not be economical so what we need to find out is a very optimal level okay where like growth is also high and feed use or feed conversion is very low so this is something that we need to ensure by not underfeeding or overfeeding the fish and then another thing is that we need to monitor the fish behavior and see that like feed wastage doesn't happen because uneaten feed pellets is an extra load on the filtration system that also add to the ammonia in the system and that will create trouble so we need to avoid that and then feeding schedule what we are following okay how much ration i am going to give okay this much percentage i am going to give this much is the frequency that i am going to give this should match with the system design every system is designed to handle a certain amount of ammonia load because as dr rajesh explained in the mass balance equation like for example 1 kg of feed if you are giving 30 percentage goes as feces so our mechanical filtration should be able to handle that and like for example you know 40 grams of ammonia is produced so our biofiltration capacity should you know balance that up so if you know like we are feeding extra feed so much of extra feed more than what our filtration you know design can handle or filtration components can handle that's going to be adversely affecting the entire production loop so this is something that we need to uh, you know like clearly keep in mind and feeding behavior should be definitely monitored whether we are using you know hand feeding manually we are feeding or we are feeding to aut through automatic or demand feeders we need to monitor the feeding behavior so that the feeding feed waste is stopped as well as like in any adverse condition so for example the water quality is not right and the fishes are not eating much we can immediately stop the feeding without wasting or putting more feed into the system so this is an important part of standard operating procedures in as rs like of ra and then another thing is health management and biosecurity so uh, you know like as we know that like you know the water is being continuously reused we cannot and again like you know we have a biofiltration components which is based on a microbial consortium just like uh, any uh, extensive or cement immune system we cannot put antibiotics or any harmful drugs just like that uh, to treat the fishes because that will you know totally destroy the biofiltration unit and that you know total system will collapse so we need to have a clear biosecurity plan so prevention is better than cure that we need to keep in mind right from stocking to harvest so if you are bringing in in terms of a fish we need to quarantine it and make sure that there is no pathogens before we put it into the system if you directly come and dump it there like and then probably if you are bringing parasites if you are bringing any other pathogen like we cannot really efficiently control inside the main rs loop so that we need to keep in mind until harvest we need to have a clear biosecurity plan in the form of okay like if in this tank i'm using this net i'm using that like it's better not to use that to the next tank so everything should be clearly planned and like we need to have hygiene barriers like uh, we cannot allow everybody we cannot really you know uh, go about with anything like so a clear biosecurity plan should be there when we before operationally we start the rs and the second thing is that like we need to follow very strict disinfection and sanitation measures either with uh, the personnel who is working there or even with the rearing units and every component needs to be strictly clean disinfected and we need to uh, manage the hygiene of the system and in biosecurity one of the main thing is we have to monitor and restrict entry and traffic of the personnel any visitors we need to really have them here or like you know clean their hands before touching anything or they should not touch any of your water because anybody can carry a pathogen and bring it and tools which is being used outside the rs system if you are bringing inside and using that we need to be very careful and again like in the rs loop itself we have integrated ozone treatment and ultraviolet radiation but still we need to make sure that the water treatment is happening in the right way because for example if the uv bulb is not working we need to make sure that the pathogen uh, content is not coming or like it is being removed and another thing that we can do for health management is that like uh, we can minimize handling and rearing stress so if you are maintaining water quality properly rearing stress is minimized and if you are not repeatedly handling or chasing the fishes in the tanks um, you know that will also minimize stress and better like so for this we need to have an effective product production plan when to sample how much to sample and for growth monitoring and everything and in any case there will be definitely occasional deaths 
and we need to make sure that the dead individuals are immediately removed from the system. We should not allow it to decay because that will put extra thing as well as there will be unwanted bacterial growth or any you know pathogenic growth there. So we need to remove the dead. And morbid fish also we need to remove. And like the morbid fish immediately should be sent for uh, diagnostic laboratories to find out what is the infectious agent, like the, which is a causative agent which is causing that. And even if you observe any deformities, because in RA systems, there are certain deformities that happens with the high density growths. For example, the swim bladder deformity happens. Uh, some skeletal system, I mean, skeletal, uh, you know, deformities can happen. So this we need to see through their swimming behavior, any abnormal behavior, any abnormal external signs. This we need to make sure. Okay. Yeah, sorry again, just I'll... Uh... Okay. Yes. Uh... So again, periodic. So here, this is this also should be in, integrated in the biosecurity plan. How frequently we do our health checkups. So like, uh, if periodically we can take some samples out and see if everything uh, externally is, you know, like um, right. For example, in salmon farming, they use swim scores. Like they, they still uh, see the gill condition, fin conditions, eye conditions, and make sure that the fishes are good. So these things can be followed. And then like we need to quarantine the sick fish and identify the disease agent before putting any treatment or starting any treatment. And we need to understand in an RA is always treating fish with therapeutics can be done, but that should be the last resort. And treating therapeutics means like we cannot use everything. Like antibiotics is a strict no. We can use a certain low level of formalin. We can use hydrogen peroxide and salt. But this should not be at the other levels which was prescribed for, you know, like a raceway system. We need to optimize for the RAS loop so that it doesn't affect the biofiltration efficiency. And again, like accumulation happens whatever we are adding gets accumulated because we are not really flushing through the entire water so these are things we need to really uh, be careful in the health management and biosecurity aspects and then like we need to really work out a maintenance strategy as well as emergency preparedness for example like there is a lot of uh, equipments which we are using in the RS loop and there is a lot of moving parts so we need to make sure that at least in once in six months we grease the moving parts so that due to friction there is not much of wear and tear and um, again, we need to see if the bearings of the equipments are in the right condition. If you have to change it, we have to change it. So again, so for that, we need to understand our, you know, like uh, components very much better. And if we use belts, if we are using any other components, what can bear down, we should have backup of that. So that when it stops, immediately we should be in a position to replace that and restart that particular unit. And for example, for systems like UV, uh, filters like we need to see the lifetime of the lamp and we need to periodically, you know, uh, replace the UV lamp so that the UV filtration keeps on happening. And as Dr. Rajesh was explaining, for example, in a freshwater RA, I mean, uh, RA system for rainbow trout, when we are using a fluidized sand filter, the fine sand which is used will becoming uh, will be becoming unusable as we progress. So like some part of the biofilter media should be replaced for efficient biofiltration. So this is something that we need to keep in mind. And then like, it's very good to check our pump and equipment performance periodically based on their electricity consumption or through any other performance efficiency measures so that we can make sure that like, you know, the pumps are functioning to an optimal efficiency, right? Otherwise the energy consumption will be more and that will also be economically not right for the operation. And another thing that we can see is that um, we need to clean the biofilter shumps, you know, and any water reservoir that we have and remove the sludge out. Otherwise, hydrogen sulfide, you know, growth, I mean, uh, formation will be there. So these things, we need to have a clear maintenance strategy. And then like for, as a backup measure, definitely we should have additional pumps in an RS loop. It's more or less like having additional hearts in the body. So we need to have additional pumps and just we need to rotate the use of that pumps so that like one pump doesn't run the whole time and does not really gets wore down. Like because pump, if it stops for, you know, 10 minutes, even that's going to stress the fishes so heavily with a high stocking density. So we should be very careful in this. And then it's a strict thing is that like we should have a backup electricity generator. Electricity is more or less like the central nervous system. It's the brain which signals. So we need to make sure that the electricity is always available. Otherwise, it's a stroke condition. Okay, one is a heart attack condition and another is a stroke condition, and that cannot happen because this is a life threatening. 
So these two things should be operating very regularly without stoppage. So we need to ensure that and we should have backups and which is possible in RAS, unlike like our body, right? And another thing is that like we need to have provision to add oxygen in any case of emergency so that like, you know, at least we can extend the time in which we can repair the other components, okay? So this is also an important thing. And we need to have an alarm and uh, system so that we should be aware, you know, like what is happening in there basically. It's more or less a burglar alarm we have. We set it in our house. Somebody opens the door without our knowledge and we get an alarm and we know that like, okay, somebody is there and we need to stop them. So something like that, if anything creeps up, any adverse water quality, we should be knowing that that's happening uh, when it crosses a threshold level. For example, oxygen, we need an optimum, say, like of eight milligrams per liter. And it falls down to six milligrams per liter in the system. We should be having a threshold of that and we should get an alarm so that we can go and immediately rectify. So these are things that we need to keep in mind. And another thing is we need to have an emergency action plan. So the staff of the RAS, like who are working in the RAS, should be trained to immediately respond to any emergency. We should not wait till it happens and before we find a way, the fishes will die. So if you have already thought about that and worked out a plan, at least we can have a better chance of saving the stock in any emergency situation. So this is also an important thing. And one thing that we need to remember is that in an RA system, we are putting very high stocking density. And with that, like there's a lot of accumulation of organic load and different things which we, we may not want, okay? So one is that like uh, off flavor substance, like as we talked before, accumulation of geosmin and fullmetal isobornium. And how this is coming is from cyanobacteria and this gives a earthy or musty off flavor. So what happens is that these compounds goes and gets accumulated in the liquid rich tissues. And if you are not taking that out of the thing, like when it goes to the market, that there can be a bad smell coming out of the fish and that can reduce the product value. So we need to do a depuration process, okay? So what exactly is that? Like how it is done? So in a commercial system where it is 100 kg of fish is being produced from, you know, 1000 liters of water, let us assume. Like the fish before it's sent to the market, okay? It's important to take it to a clean flow through. Like from the recirculating loop, we need to take it to another tank where, you know, a flow through system, water is flowed through, are partially used, and then like we need to stop feeding so that there is no additional load of any organic matter there and with increased flushing and lower hydraulic retention time so that like the water is not retained that there should not be any biofilm formation, the purging or the cleaning happens. And this accumulation of geosmin and methyl isoburnium will move out of the body to the outside environment and will be flushed out. So this can be done efficiently. And for salmon farming, like in RAS, for example, they say it's best to keep the fish uh, 10 to 15 days without feed. And like if we just keep them flushing, like the, off, uh, you know, yeah, off flavor uh, accumulation, we can stop it. Like, for example, when you're talking about a production uh, productivity of 30 kilograms per meter cube, that's not a big deal. But when you're thinking of 100 kg, of flavor accumulation will be more and we have to be careful. And another thing is that depuration tank, if you disinfect it before we put in the fishes, right, with hydrogen peroxide, like this also will fasten or like make the, uh, you know, geosmin removal process very fast. So these are some things that we can add to our RAS loop to improve the quality. So any very big system when we are planning, these are strict must for the system. And waste management, one of the best thing about RAS is that unlike any other, for example, in rainbow trout, in a flow through system, all the waste goes to the natural ecosystem and, you know, like uh, that can be environmentally harmful. But in RAS, we can capture all the waste and reclaim, even like, you know, there can be a closed cycle, we can use the nutrients again and the environmental output can be decreased in the following ways. For example, the sludge or the solid waste that is coming out, that can be dewatered, okay? The water can be separated from the solid part and can be used as a nitrogen and phosphorus rich fertilizer, which will be extremely good for plant growth, okay? So that is one thing. And another thing that, you know, already people are doing is microalgal production because already the nutrient rich RA effluent water will be taken to another microalgal production unit and Swedish algal factory is doing this. So they can produce a lot of microalgae. So this is more or less called a circular economy. Nothing is wasted. Even the waste is being reused and, you know, used to make money again. So valorization and circular economy comes here. And another thing is that conversion of solid waste to biogas by anaerobic digestion. So for example, we have a solid uh, waste. We can uh, convert it to biogas by anaerobic digestion and we can use this biogas again for a heating system or to produce and meet out certain part of the electricity needs of the system. So these are uh, interesting things which huge players are already doing. And another thing is integration of RAS effluent with agriculture practice, aquaponics. So aquaponics is basically a hybrid of RAS with the plant culture systems, but the plant culture system is a bigger 
proportion that. So here, like what we can see is like if the RX of one can be used for any agricultural practice, be it aquaponics or even the other, you know, wetland systems, what we say, constructed wetlands, open wetlands, like then like uh, agricultural practices can be there and the productivity will be more like, so we can be having a circular economy there as well. And another thing is that like, for example, when we want to reuse, I mean, minimize the water usage, we can add denitrifying biological filters, which will even remove nitrate from the system. Um, so that can be really good, right? Uh, I mean, nitrate and nitrogen can be removed. So this is one thing that we can do, even waste management it comes under the standard operating procedure in a RAS. And uh, just to conclude, like first thing that we need to understand is that SOP, standard operating procedures are just as important as having the right RAS technology. We need to have the right RAS technology definitely well planned, designed and put in place. And the second thing what you have to plan is a very good standard operating procedure. The second thing that we need to know is for standard operation, there are certain things we need to understand very good. Like, and that is first the biology of the fish species. What fish we are working on, what it eats, what it requires, how its physiology is, what its basic biology is. This, we need to have a clear idea. And system design, we should exactly know in and out of the system what components we have, what are its limitations, what are its advantages, what problems can come in, we need to be very careful. And we need to know about water quality changes. Okay, this can happen and how to deal with that. This idea should be there clearly with us. And we should have a clear idea about nitrogen cycles. Okay, how efficient my nitrogen cycle should be. And then only we can just fit it across the observations and we can balance it up. And then we should have a clear production and a clear biosecurity plan, as I mentioned earlier. And then feed composition and feeding regime should be very clearly decided because this will be very deciding factors of the productivity that we can take out as well as the profitability. And if we are making a really good use of the RAS loop, okay, like and the components of the RAS loop, we can minimize water usage, electricity usage, and oxygen consumption is something that we need to always keep in mind based on the carrying capacity or the production capacity of the system. And another good thing for us to know is the mechanics and the maintenance of the system. If, if there is any component that fails, we should be at least able to find out basics and we should be able to address that at an immediate way, I mean, in an immediate manner. So like we need to really know that. Another thing is emergency systems and procedures should be in place. Risk avoidance is a must in RA systems. One of the biggest reasons why RA systems fails is that people don't plan emergency systems procedures and they don't have risk avoidance measures. So backups are needed where it should be. Generators are strictly needed. And, uh, you know, oxygen things, I mean, backup oxygenators, backup water pumps are strictly needed to avoid any, you know, accidents in the system. So these are procedures that we need to keep in mind and market requirements. Basically, uh, without understanding what the market needs, if you are doing a different sort of species, different sort of production system uh, that can, you know, uh, that can burn our fingers economically. So we need to be very careful about, before we plan the RA system, we also should know what the market requires. So with this, like, I'll thank you very much for your patient listening and um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Biju. Uh, for you, TL explained uh, many of the questions which probably would have been in uh, participants' mind. Like, do you really need to exchange water? Uh, what What is the monitor? What should be monitored, and how frequently the water quality has to be monitored? Uh, how to overcome unavoidable circumstances, and uh, and how to treat uh, waste, and especially the importance of feed. Because uh, ultimately, it's the feed quality which uh, ensures the success of uh, RAs. Just to give an, uh, to add in a point, uh, many people were telling the carps, like especially Indian major carps, do not uh, perform very good in uh, RAs. One of the major reasons for this is the quality of feed what is given. Because uh, the feed which is used for, uh, for supplementary feed in the farm, farm uh, in the uh, pond system will not apply in um, RAs, we need complete nutrition because there is no supplementary nutrition here. So any feed uh, need to be very complete in their uh, uh, nutrient profile uh, based on the requirement. So thank you, Doctor Biju. So with this, uh, we can take some of the questions which are there in the chat box. Um, the one is. Uh, uh, okay, can you mute here? Uh, the first question is, uh, yeah. 
is there any specific feed for rls so yeah definitely there are uh, in india we uh, indian companies do not have any uh, specific but then there are a lot of uh, the companies from uh, spreadings for example as rls specific feeds which are uh, uh, specifically meant for uh, especially rainbow trout and salmon and many many countries and many feed uh, commercial feed the manufacturers are are uh, working on that and producing a uh, specific feed for rls so i hope uh, he also has covered uh, in detail uh, and there is another question uh, dako can you mute it uh, i mean to say there is the volume so another question is can we treat uh, yeah Uh, the waste water where is it disposed i think uh, dr biju explained it uh, to uh, add some more point on that the waste the fecal matter if you analyze them they, it has still you know around 30% of protein and dry matter masses and it also contains around 30% of minerals and rest is fiber so it is still nutrient it's a very good nutrient for uh, plants uh, another option you can definitely use in as agriculture uh, uh, feeds another option is you can use it uh, for uh, biogas production of course you cannot use completely like cow, uh, cow dung but along with the cow dung you can use it as for co digestion let's say 10 to 20% of the waste you can mix with the 80% is cow dung to produce biogas uh, uh, this waste alone cannot be used because uh, the, the composition is not so suitable but then co digestion can be used and uh, as biju said the uh, Uh, there is uh, you can uh, use it for uh, production of uh, microalgae and uh, even aquaponics is one of the another option to utilize the waste water yeah is there any other fish we can culture in uh, uh, rs definitely uh, uh, rs is suitable for uh, most uh, any kind of fishes uh, but then mostly you need to look into the 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 economic point of view uh, other than rainbow trout we can culture sea bass uh, mostly in cold water area i feel at least in indian condition it's as of now it is rainbow trout probably in the uh, middle region where we can um, the temperature based suitable we can culture uh, common carp but then the the market rate is one of the issue other fishes like in warm water we can culture sea bass and many catfishes number of catfishes marels and uh, pabda singhi they are the other option even indian meat can carp also can culture okay okay in rs system is there any impact on natural friendly bacteria uh in fact um, uh, there is no impact on natural in fact we enhance the growth of uh, natural friendly bacteria like nitrifying bacteria uh through enhancing the biofilter but then uh, at the same time we uh try uh, avoiding this pathogenic or other heterotrophic bacterial uh, growth through disinfection but natural friendly bacteria is not affected because uh in this is for the system which is required uh nitrifying bacteria we enhance it Uh, through the process of biofiltration so the objective of biofiltration is to enhance those uh, growth of nitrifying bacteria uh, providing the so proper uh, surface area for the growth of bacteria as well as the correct environment for that and dissolved oxygen and alkalinity requirement are rs red fishes uh, more susceptible diseases um uh this question yeah it is not like that uh when you have a well designed system with the disinfections and biosecurity measures they are uh, much better uh, biosecure compared to uh the open water system can we culture monodon in system uh, yes definitely uh, the tenes monodon the shrimp uh, can be cultured in rs Uh, like venomize are uh, definitely uh, are uh, cultured in uh, in many of the european countries these venomize are cultured so in that is monodon also definitely cultured 
and people are even trying in uh, many other many other uh, high stocking density systems so if there is a, if uh, i think that's the questions which i can see, see in the chat box so if somebody has questions they can uh, open unmute and ask if some questions we can take up some questions maybe three four questions we can take okay there is another question is there any certificate provided after this training yeah we do not uh, as of now we did not plan to provide a certificate if you are providing certificate probably we need to conduct an exam so how much you understood but then we yeah, will take care of from the next training probably we can try to at least give a participation uh, certificate yeah we'll try to share a youtube link for this uh, this uh, whole uh, recording will be put in youtube so we'll share in the youtube link with the registered participant in the icr dcfr official website uh, at the same time i i can share uh, some of the information not all uh, with the people yeah is there any questions uh, anybody want to ask uh, they can unmute themselves and ask. good afternoon sir yeah please uh, actually uh, we believe that a uh, lot of sensors uh, are needed in the rs system right. for monitoring monitoring and all but actually we don't find uh, sensors in the market Uh, very easily, and all the sensors are uh, either in uh, made from USA or in Germany. That is too much, highly costly. That can be available for research purpose, but for commercial agriculture, it is not very much feasible. So, can we just uh, get an idea about the sensors, the basic sensors that are required for uh, this commercial approach in RAS and all, sir? See, basic sensors. Uh, what you required is uh, basically one sensor is sufficient. That is dissolved oxygen. See, other sensors are not so essential. Uh, dissolved oxygen sensor, if you have at least one very good sensor, because this is you need to have a very good quality sensor. Because in the local market, there are uh, very uh, poor quality sensors are available which do not work after few. Uh, uh, sometimes after a crop. Yes. So, yes. Yes. So, we have tried. We yeah. have tried a few of the sensors, but this is exactly. uh, simply so, not recommended. Yeah. Exactly. Strictly not recommended. The local sensors. Because uh, they are not so meant for a long-term purpose, so there are various companies. Uh, I would say uh, we have uh, like YSI company we are using one one probe which uh, provides that is well. Uh, I mean uh, we are using from last one and one half one most more than one and a half year. It's working nicely, but then yes, as you said, it's expensive. A probe itself, uh, oxygen sensor itself, cost uh, more than. Uh, Uh, one lakh rupees, and then you need a monitoring system. That is exactly right. And there are a lot of Indian companies. Uh, Eruaka, there is another company, which are um, already into, yeah into developing sensor, and they have uh, quite reliable uh, sensors. And uh, do you have any idea about the cost? About them? Yeah, we uh, unfortunately we don't. Yeah, we can find out and share you if you send the email ID. So it will be very much uh, helpful if you can please uh, share the sensors and the. Uh, SCADA system and all the details regarding with uh, RAS and all. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Actually, 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 I am from the fisheries department, government of West Bengal, and okay. we are also we are also running some of the RAS projects. Actually, right. one of one of uh, the person uh, entrepreneur has purchased the entire RAS system from Bioefficiency, that is from uh, yeah, I from. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and uh, he has invested almost sixty lakhs. But uh, due to the sensor failure and all so many things, oh, his system is working uh, okay. But yeah. he doesn't have any uh, this type of sensors and all those things. So okay. we want to we want to help him uh, from our uh, end, and at least if we can get any idea right. regarding the yeah. same, it will be very much nice for us, sir. Yeah, exactly. The one more thing is that what I want to say. See, when we are investing crores of rupees, the yeah. sensor I think uh, the Y sensor which costed around uh, five lakh for us, which. Uh, Uh, which has a four oxygen probes. Uh, so, so, investing one crore, we can go on invest another five lakhs for the safety of the system. So, I really uh, think that you need to go for a quality uh, sensors. Definitely, we'll share what are the other companies which are available. Uh, we can share you. you uh, kindly share your email ID uh, in the chat box, or you can write to us uh, in the email ID, which I will be sharing in the chat box. Uh, is there any questions uh, 
uh, I think. Uh, uh, sir, sir, can can we use uh, out of it? Is... Can can you repeat your question, sir? Can we use our uh, auto feeders in RAS system? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, we can use auto feeders in RAS, but then. Uh, it's also the auto feeder is not like uh, you need to set for a certain level of feeding, but then you need to also do a hand feeding to decide whether they're uh, you're feeding extra or not. All these things you have to you, hand feeding with the auto feeding you can use. Yeah, otherwise uh, they'll be you will be end up feeding extra or less. For uh, you need both the system. Can we? Somebody ask ask. Can we use live feed in RAS? um i think a live feed means uh, for uh, definitely is for uh, if it is a larval uh, uh, rearing system we can use live feeds there is no issue and for uh, for uh, for grow out i think live feeds may not be suitable um, larval feed uh, larval uh, rearing definitely we can live feed is there any question so otherwise we'll be moving to the next session or um we can uh, uh, move to the next session uh dr uh, devish sharma sir are you there yeah i am there as yeah okay yeah uh, sir uh, so we have uh, uh, covered many of the questions and um, i finally uh, Welcome, Dr. Devji Sharma, sir, who is in fact, uh, well, in fact, uh, the main backbone to start RAS research in uh, DCFR Bintal. So I request to give your uh, remarks, sir. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy and that uh, today this webinar, I mean, which is the second webinar we have organized from BCFR, uh, giving the knowledge and providing information to the participants regarding recirculating aquaculture system, particularly for rainbow trout farming uh, in uh, Indian Himalayan region. So as uh, Dr. Raja said, uh, we have organized in January, where uh, near about 500 participants participated and we got a lot of feedback and that was our first webinar and today we have organized the second one and also in fact we had given a training to i think uh, three officers from himachal pradesh uh, physically who came here and they were here with us for you know i think uh, for three to four days and they saw our you know the success stories of rs uh, recirculating in the rainbow trout farming in RAS and we had giving, given training in detail to them and uh, we have a plan in FUSAM to give a physical training uh, for selected participants or maybe incubators or maybe entrepreneurs who are ready to come and you know take training in RAS and uh, further they can establish in their own places. So that is our plan and I really congratulate uh, Dr. Rajesh M, who is working on RAS and also Dr. Biju for giving uh, detailed uh, lectures on basic principles and uh, functioning and different components involved on RAS and also the SOP, the standard operating protocol of culturing rainbow trout in RAS. I think uh, most of the details uh, are being covered and uh, they have delivered quite well. And uh, most questions that we got it from the participants are also being answered. I think if you have further any questions, you can write to Dr. Rajesh in his mail and he will be answering in detail of your you know, queries. So only one thing I would like to say that uh, RAS system we are talking about, uh, basically to you know, minimize the you know, use of water and also to enhance the you know production in, in uh, Indian hill fish farming system, particularly of rainbow trout farming, because rainbow trout is the only fish which is a high value fish in our Indian Himalayan region. And definitely we need to look for and we need to enhance the 
production and productivity of this fish in the country. So at present, uh, I, I, so in this context, I'd like to say that uh, RAS system also a climate, you know, the independent system. See, it is a climate resilient, you know, farming system we can tell about. Because when you talk about, you know, rainbow trout farming in Indian Himalayan region, always there is a problem of, you know, water extremity. In most of the cases in Himachal Pradesh and also in Uttarakhand and some other states, always you find the farmers are having a loss in their production or in their resource system because of the, you know, flesh floods and due to the heavy rain and other, you know, other, you know, weather calamities. So what should be the solution? What will be the solution? The solution may be because we do not have a control on our, you know, extreme rain. We do not have a control on, you know, natural calamities. So always rainbow trout farming in Indian Himalayan region is in a climate, you know, dependent practices. So what is the solution? The RAS, recirculating aquaculture system, practicing rainbow trout farming in recirculating aquaculture system maybe is one of the solution because it is a climate independent. We can control because the climate, natural calamities may not or we can control to reduce some extent, may not directly have an impact on the, you know, rainbow trout farming during the entire, you know, you know, culture process. So that's how, like, you know, farmers will be getting more benefit and they will be kind of assuring they are, you know, produce. Say they may not be at a loss of the production halfway. And, you know, all of us, we know very well, that they may not be described. Already Dr. Rajesh, and Dr. Bizu has described in detail that how much water will save from one lakh liter to 1000 liter water will save while, you know, concerning rainbow trout in, you know, RAS in compared to flow through the system. So when we visited, I mean, all of you know very well, you have the experience when you, you see like, you know, the, some of the farmers in Himachal Pradesh, I'm giving example always Himachal Pradesh because they are the leader in rainbow trout farming, particularly in Kulu district, Pahanala area. Some of the farmers are shutting down the rainbow trout farming because of the non-availability of the, you know, water. The water is, was available 10 years back when they started rainbow trout farming. But today there is no water available for the, you know, rainbow trout farming, which when the amount is supposed to be. 10 years back, it was available. So we do not know, we cannot predict the whole, you know, climate sense process and water availability. So rain, RS, I mean, rainbow trout farming in RS will solve this problem. The farmers will be quite assured of their production status and production capacity because that will be a climate independent and it will be a totally automatized system. It is a totally mechanized activities and we'll have a control over our you know, production system. So thereby, even like, you know, in our own farm at Sampabad, once, once a while when their water is available, but today there is a scarcity in water. So to minimize the water, I mean, the use, or, you know, with the minimizing water, how we can produce rainbow trout farming, RAS is a solution, and it is a really climate independent and, you know, climate resilient farming system which can be a game changer. I'm telling the word game changer because if you see today, entire country's production is uh, 1,500 ton. Now at present, we can say 1,600 ton also. But, you know, from 1,600 to, if we can, we can have the best management practices in FTR, I'm talking about flow through system. If we can from 1,600 to suppose 3,000 uh, ton, you know, per thousand ton, we can have the best management practices from, you know, say 10, you know, kg per meter cube in FTR. We are at present producing 10 kg to 15 kg per meter cube. So if you have the best management practice in FTR, if we can make it double, then also we can jump up to 3000 kilo, not more than that. At present, how, what are the, you know, number of resources available? If you can have the best management practice, with, you know, good feed and entire practices, we can only go up to double, I mean, from 1600 to 3000. But you think it up a figure of 10,000 kilo, 
if we have to go jump up to five times or 10 times to have a country's vision of producing 10,000 ton rainbow trout by 2024 or 25, what is the alternative? So that's why I say rain, RAS is a game changer. That's why I'm saying to have a you know, five times jump or to a 10 times jump, like from 10 kg per meter cube to go for 50 kilo per meter cube and 60 kilo per meter cube is already Dr. Rajesh has demonstrated. Or Dr. Already Rajesh has demonstrated 40 to 50 kilo you know, production in RAS, which is possible. So to jump up to five to six times to from 1600 to 10,000 ton, RAS is the only solution. Along with the best management practices, definitely RAS will has to play big role to achieve the production of at least 10,000 ton in the country. So, but its basics should be understand. I mean, we should understand the its basics. We should understand the principle. We should understand the SOP, the standard operating protocol. It's you know feeding use of feed give, giving feed feeding efficiency. The growth curve we need to understand the maturation of biofiltrator. We should understand the different filter we use from chill separator to drum filters. We need to understand how it is working and also different sensor like oxygen and then other things. Definitely, you know, removing the carbon dioxide from the system. You know, so all these things we need to understand. And definitely, I mean, although it looks very, you know, tough at this moment, but if you, you if you really work on that, it's not very tough technology. It's a very simple technology, but we need to understand and we need to have, you know, you know, we need to have experience on that. And then if we put into practice, I think definitely our rainbow trout production into a country will achieve into the higher level. And already, although Dr. Rajesh explained everything in detail, and I think if you contact him, he will be able to guide you properly and uh, he will able to uh, he can tell you from his own experience because uh, he has done with his hand and he has got the success stories. He's not telling from the you know theoretical point of view. He has told you based on the based on the success stories you have, based on the production level he has achieved. He has already achieved three cycles production, so he will be able to definitely guide you in in, in this direction. So. Uh, initial investment definitely there are different schemes already our director doctor uh, director has already said in the beginning there are a lot of schemes are uh, there uh, the ministries are giving a lot of schemes through nfdb so schemes are not a problem and uh, there are different models like you know already dr Rajesh ex explained say so one entrepreneurship model where we have invested say more than 30 lakhs and there is another model where if you invest at least three to four lakhs that also can we they are also we can produce you know some you know some profit and also at least you know 250 kilo production from a you know seven meter cube uh, of tank so that may be more economical also for the you know marginal farmers so all these things uh, need to be understood and uh, this is the second you know seminar we are organizing and definitely We'll be, you know, looking forward to meet you physically once this corona is over. And definitely, the technology what we have, we have, you know, validated need to be released under, you know, ICR NICRA schemes. And I think more farmers will be encouraged to, you know, take up this technology for the benefit, uh, which may be economical, economically viable technology, and which will definitely help the farmers of the Indian Himalayan region enhancing the trout production in the country. So I congratulate uh, Dr. Rajesh uh, for organizing this uh, particular um, you know, training program webinar and uh, giving the most valuable lecture based on the experience and also Dr. Bizu for providing a most valuable lecture uh, for, to the participants. So thank you so much and thank you Dr. Rajesh. Uh, thank you sir uh, for emphasizing on the uh, the, the implications of uh, RAs on the, the total vision of the country to produce uh, uh, to meet the target that is at, uh, set by the, the government agencies. Uh, with this, uh, we are uh, we have come to the end of uh, come to an end of uh, this RAs uh, lecture series. So I would uh, first of all thank all the participants for. Uh, uh, 
taking out their time and attending this program. And uh, in fact, uh, I would say this is not the end. In fact, uh, as uh, uh, directors told, this is the beginning. So if somebody has any question to be, um, or any guidance need to be uh, provided, so you can write to me and uh, you can always contact our uh, DCFR for the, any kind of help. So with this, uh, I also thank uh, uh, Director Dr. Uh, Pramod Kumar Pandey for uh, organizing this kind of uh, program and uh, Dr. David Sharma initially to support and start um, the recirculatory aquaculture system at ICIDC. Uh, okay. Uh, and also doc, uh, Dr. Biju for, uh, and all the NICRA team uh, for uh, helping all uh, to conduct many various experiments. And especially special thanks to ITMU cell, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Ritesh Tandil uh, and uh, Amit Saxenaji and all ITMU team for supporting. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll close the meeting now.